Any questions on that? There, there can't be any such being as the Lord when, when a polytheistic setting. When there's many gods, there's no such thing as the God, the Lord. Secondly, the Old Testament writers claim to speak the exact words of God. They use the phrase, the word of the Lord came to. They, they, use, they use this term. We see that in nearly every case. The word was either hard to believe or hard to deliver. The word of the Lord came to Abraham. You're going to have a son. You're too old. Your wife's too old. You've been trying all your life. That hasn't worked. But now at the end of your life, when the odds are against you the most, is when you're going to have a son. Hard to, hard to believe. Hard to deliver. We talk about Nathan. It says the word of the Lord came to. It doesn't say that Nathan just kind of woke up one night and said, I think I'll just go tell David that he is a, an adulterer and a murderer. It says the word of the Lord came to. And it's something that would have been a very difficult thing to, to deliver. The New Testament Christ the Apostles confirm the status of the Old Testament writers as in, inspired this point speaks to the two or three witnesses provision as outlined in the New Testament and the Old Testament. For if the Old Testament witnesses to itself, then the requirement of two or three witness, witnesses is met with Christ and the apostles. So if the Old Testament testifying itself, that it's the word of God, the inspired word of God, we have Christ clearly affirming the Old Testament as the inspired word of God. And we have the apostles doing the same thing. We have two or three witnesses at least. We actually have more but these are the main ones. Number four then, where we um, did not really speak too much last week, we'll address this and move on. Christ and the apostles specifically identify Old Testament writers as speaking for God. That is, they often quote the Old Testament writers as specifically saying that God said, or the Holy Spirit spoke through, or spoken by the Lord through the prophet. It would seem that the New Testament writers made little or no distinctions on this point. Please understand this. This is a significant point. A New Testament writer will say something like God said or the Holy Spirit spoke through. And all we really have is the Old Testament writer just writing. The Old Testament writer in some cases doesn't even say, well, this is what the Lord says. He's just writing. And then the New Testament writer comes along and says, God said this. That is quite an absolute testimony. If you want some references, we won't, we won't look them up. Um, we'll look up one of them. Matthew 1, 22, Matthew 2, 15, um, Acts 1, 16, and 2, 17, Romans 9, 25. But we're going to look up Hebrews 1 real quickly. I, I, I want you to note the casual nature of the, of, of the writer here as, as how he's appealing to the Old Testament as the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke to, has spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days, last days, spoken to us by the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Verse 5, for which, to which of the angels did he ever say? Who's the he? What's the antecedent of he there? It's God. In verse 1, right? And look at the casual nature that the, the, the writer of the Hebrews has not proven anything. He's just assuming that we know this. For which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son this day, I have begotten you? And again, I will be the father to him, and he shall be a son, to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he says, Who makes his angel spirits as ministers of flame of fire? But under the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he just goes on throughout the entire chapter, just saying rather casually, this is God speaking. God said these things. So for the dear people that want to say that's written by men, well, not according to the writer of the book of Hebrews. We'll get into that a little bit later. An objection as we, as we transition to the New Testament here this morning. Here's an objection. If you use the New Testament to confirm the Old Testament, 
Aren't you simply begging the question, merely putting off the inevitable? Hey, I challenge the Old Testament as being inspired by God. You can't answer it by saying that the New Testament is inspired by God if it affirms the Old Testament. An answer. A book that claims to be the Word of God, this is so many other things can be said here. We want to just address this very quickly and, and move on. An answer. A book that claims to be the Word of God demands investigation, does it not? Especially a book that, in Western culture, is the best-selling book of all time. And I have to just sit, sit back and, and say something. Well, um, this book actually claims to be the Word of God. Does any book that claims to be the Word of God demand some sort of investigation at some point? The answer is, of course it does. Now the objection always comes up, well, hey, I could just write a book and claim that to be the Word of God. Well, do it. Let's see how that works out for you. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, although it is impossible to obtain exact figures, there's little doubt that the Bible is the world's best-selling and most widely distributed book. World. Not U.S., not UK, world. A survey by the Bible Society concluded that around 2.5 billion copies were printed between 1815 and 1975, but more recent estimates put the number at more than 5 billion. The whole Bible has been translated into 349 languages. There are 2,123 languages that have at least one book of the Bible in that language. It has been, re been reported that 800 million copies of the red-covered booklet quotations from the works of Mao Zedong were sold or distributed between June 1966 and September 1971. And that was when they were required to read the thing. As far as I know, when it comes to the Bible, I, know, I don't know anyone who has a gun to anybody's head and says, you've got you to you have a copy of the Bible. I don't know of any cases like that. <laughs> That's a little bit different with the sayings of Chairman Mao. You see, Someone could say, well, I could write a book and I could claim to be the Word of God. Yeah, let's see how you, let, let's see how you, how you do as a bestseller. Let's see how you do as having it uh, translate in other languages. It is, a, it, it is an empty claim. It's a claim of a person who does not want to find out what's really true. Partly. partly because he's got an a priori problem, which we'll de deal with in a minute. A question we might ask, is it possible for the God who created the world and raised his son up from the dead, that God, is it possible that he could use human instruments to write down exactly what he wanted them to write? That's a question we must ask. The God that created butterflies for Pete's sake, that a month ago was a disgusting caterpillar, and now it's a butterfly. That God, could he, could he actually use human instruments to write what he wanted? Because we always get this, it was written by men. Well, could he use men to transmit his word? If the answer is yes, that he could do this, then isn't your objection really based on an a priori or a, or a prior commitment? A rejection of the God who claims to have inspired the Bible. That's really what it comes down to. I can't believe that God the rock God wrote the Bible. Oh, by the way, I don't believe that there's such a thing as God. Which is a lie, because we know that the fool has said in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. There's no such thing as an atheist. There may be a professing atheist. But we have, on good authority, the Bible itself, that atheists don't exist. An atheist says, or a professing atheist says, God doesn't exist. God says that atheists don't exist. Briefly then, we will examine, in, in the inspiration of the New Testament, oh, questions by the way. The, Got the mic, here's the mic. The fact that, the fact that a, a book is a bestseller of all time, does it prove by, by the sales figures well, how is it that that proves that the Bible is true? It, it I mean, doesn't claim you're making. Right. It, it, it doesn't prove that it's true. However, what it does prove is that, as we said earlier this morning, 
they have a, a, a bigger, a, 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 a larger miracle now in front of them. How in the world could something that is just a flat out lie possibly be believed by this many people and no one is just as, as smart as you? How, how can that really, really happen? And that's, it, it, it's, it's a lot harder for them to explain that than it is for me to explain there's a God who created the world and he's written a book for us. That's a lot of explaining to do. A book that's a bestseller of all time and it's based on a huge lie, which you as an unbeliever can't even explain the lie anyway because you don't really believe in truth. You don't really believe in anything. So here is a book that purports to present the God who created the world versus what? Really nothing. I mean, really. They, they have nothing. Gary North always says you can't be something. Yeah. And that's, that's, why, that's why atheism never really takes over. Even the, uh, even the Greeks who presented themselves as atheists had this pantheon of gods that just went on and on and on. I mean, China. How long did China do with its official atheistic uh, culture? China's atheistic culture is under attack. How did the, uh, how the Bolsheviks do? Not too well. The claims of Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit, uh, other questions, thank you. Why is it okay to um, translate scriptures you know, there's no other book in the world that has all these translations. Why is it okay to translate it and translate it and translate it and retranslate it? Why is that okay? That's, that's a question that I will get into more in Bible translations. And what we're going to talk about then is the purpose for these translations. Um, talk about copyright laws. Um, as I mentioned before, and we'll... I, okay, we'll talk about this more, but just real quickly. As I've mentioned before, there's, the Christian market is, let's face it, it's a moneymaker if you can do the right thing. Christian music. How many, uh, how many secular musicians got their start with a naive Christian population? I mean, come on, can we talk? <laughs> I, I hate to even say it, but it's true. They get popular, they get on the charts, and then they, they, they come out and declare that they're whatever, right? Oh, but they got their start from the naive Christian... The Christian market is a, it's a great market if you can get into it because for the most part the Christian market is not as discerning as the unbelievers. So there's money to be made in the Christian market. We'll talk more about that. We'll examine inspiration of the New Testament claims of Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit, and the claim of the New Testament itself. If we don't have any other questions. The claims of Christ. Here's one for you. How's this for a claim? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Let me ask you something this morning. What do you know that's permanent? If someone were to ask you what is permanent, what would you say? You wouldn't say yourself, because as my friend and fellow elder John Bingaman is want to say. None of us get out alive. So not me. How about your house? You live in a good stone house? Permanent? Not really. It can burn down. What's permanent? Well, we, we might say heaven and earth. Right? Jesus Christ says even if heaven and earth passes away, my words will not pass away. Now that's a statement you have to consider. There is no one who can make a statement like that. N nobody. Christ did it. Christ said this. That's a claim, my friends. That is a claim to inspiration and God speak if ever there was one. Because what is more permanent than heaven and earth? The only being more permanent than heaven and earth is the being that created heaven and earth, right? Because there was a time when there was no, as we understand time, that's a hard concept, but there was a time, if you will, when there was no heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created it. 
perhaps created time at the same time, which, again, that's kind of a hard, hard issue. Christ clearly claiming God speak with this statement. He who rejects me, from John 12, 48, and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. There's also a statement of permanence. You will not always have me speaking, but these words that I speak will judge that person in the last day when they hear them. That's a, that's a statement of permanence right there, my friends. These words are going to stick around. Secondly, just kind of going quickly here, the role of the Holy Spirit. An example here in, in Acts chapter 2. But Peter, we looked at this this morning. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Now, let's look at Acts 2 again. Here. Let's see what is uh, motivating Peter. Here. Acts chapter 2. Peter just sort of like dreaming this up and on his way down to the Wawa for a cup of coffee and came across a group of people and decides to speak up. Peter, verse 14, standing up with the eleven, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. For these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter claiming the Holy Spirit for what Joel wrote in his own words as well. Because at the end, he says this. And it shall come to pass at the end of Joel's Joel's prophecy, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I asked this morning, could anyone make something like that up and then assume it was true if you just made it up? Let's say I stood up this morning, I said to you, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of my grandfather, your grandfather, will be saved? No, when you make a claim like that, I'm standing up and saying that you have to call on a certain name. In order to be saved, you are claiming inspiration at that point. Now, Joel, you're saying that you're claiming right now? No. The only reason why I can claim stand in front of you today and claim that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. The only reason why I can do that is because I have the prior inspiration of what was already written in front of me. Now let's talk about Peter here for a second. Look at, Acts, uh, look at Luke chapter 24. And Luke 24 is important because some people believe that Luke and Acts are all, all really one book. So, so just before we have Peter with this kind of courage in Acts chapter 2, look, look where he was. In Luke 24, let's, uh, let's look at uh, chapter, verse 26. Luke 24, 26. Or 36, excuse me. Sorry. They're up in the room, they're huddled together. Verse 36, and as they said these things, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen the Spirit. Verse 40, when he had said these things, he showed them his hands and his feet, but while they still did not believe for joy, he marveled and said, have you any food here? They give him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, 
And he took it and ate it in their presence. Sounds like a couple things are going here, on here. It's taking some time for them to, to settle down. They can't believe it. Now, Luke is writing this, and this, Luke's about to end his chapter. He ends it with the ascension there in, in chapter 53, or verse 53. And then just a couple of chapters later in the book of Acts, he's got this same group of people standing up with Peter, and Peter is going to deliver the sermon of his life in which he is going to blame and hold the, accountable the people who had crucified their Messiah. A few chapters before, he's scared up here in the, in, in the room with everybody else. And now he's got this kind of confidence. My friends, come up with a naturalistic explanation for that. I, I, I'd be interested to hear it. Let's see. You're scared stiff. You're so scared you don't even want, want to be seen. It wasn't that long ago when you're Peter and you were denying Christ in front of a, in front of a slave girl for Pete's sake. And a few chapters later, you're standing up with that kind of confidence that Peter said. And we said things like, whom you took and you crucified by lawless hands. Holy Spirit, my friends. Thirdly, I want to look at this quickly here. Look at 1 Timothy 5.18. You don't have to turn there. Look, look, why don't you see this? The scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. 1 Timothy 5.18. Now, where do we get the, 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 uh, the scripture? Um, you shall not muzzle the ox that uh, treads out the corn, out the grain. Get that from the Old Testament, right? Where do we get the scripture that the uh, labor is worthy of his wages? Where's that in the Old Testament? Who said Luke? Yeah, it's in Luke, right? So we have a problem. Anybody see the problem? Luke's definitely not in the Old Testament. You see what's happening here? This is said in Luke 10.7 and Matthew 10.10. 10. See what's going on? By the time Paul writes this letter to Timothy, Luke's gospel had, and Matthew's gospel had already, one or the other had already been inscripturated, and he is calling the New Testament writings the scripture already. See, this, this phrase right here, the labor is worthy of his wages. Anybody remember who said that? Christ said that. But he's not referencing Christ. He's not saying, and oh, by the way, Jesus said this. You and I might have done that. And that might have been, like, might, we might have thought that that have us have more, um, have more um, authority, if you will. But Paul doesn't do that with Timothy. Instead, he says, the scripture says, which with Timothy would have had the exact same authority as if Jesus Christ himself had said it. So already in the New Testament, canon's not even complete yet. We have Paul appealing to the scriptures that were not Old Testament and saying that the New Testament scriptures are scriptures just as much. He puts them same in, the, in, the, in the same category. You see that? Got the Old Testament here, Deuteronomy, got the New Testament. Luke and or Matthew. Doesn't really matter. Look with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Jesus is sending out his disciples, 70, and he's saying, this is how you're going to do it. Verse 7. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 10. Parallel passage. Matthew 10 and verse 10.
Verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff for a worker is worthy of his food. That's a New Testament quote right here. Paul tells Timothy it's a scripture. So we have the claims of Christ, the role of the Holy Spirit, and the claim of the New Testament itself as a scripturated word of God. Now again, my friends, we're really hustling through this bibliology class. There's so much more that could be said. But that'll do it for this morning, except for questions. Who has a question? We have a question right here. So I understand the logic there with what we were just talking about. What about the rest of the New Testament books? Yeah. The uh, last class we, that we do, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, the one you're doing today? Yeah. Well, the last class we do in this, in this bibliology course will be a, um, uh, I'm lifting it from, from Phil Kaiser who has written, uh, a pastor in Illinois, who's written an excellent piece on this, talks about, talking about how the books of the Bible are established by God and they, then they establish each other. So that's, we're, we're going to address that, that very same point. Because someone could say, well, you know, um, okay, that, that part of it is, but what about, what about the rest of it? What we're trying to establish this morning is, well, backing up a little bit, which we're, we're attempting to establish that God, in fact, can write, give us inscripturated words, in this case, that he had, and it was even recognized as early as Paul's letter to Timothy, which is actually, frankly, amazing, because if I had been writing it, I would say, well, you know, Jesus said this. Paul says, it's written in the scripture, labor is worthy of his wages. Read Luke or read Matthew. Uh, next, we have a question. The Old Testament. Now, when Jesus was born, we already had the Old Testament in total because the Jews were using it. That was the Torah. So, is our Old Testament what is exactly in the Torah? I know they have 22 books and it's like rearranged different or something, but I don't think I've ever seen one. So, what are the differences in the Old Testament and the Torah? Yeah, um, some people will call the Torah, if you will, just the first five books of Moses. That's what some people call that. That's my understanding of it in most cases. Um, what happened with the Jews, of course, was they wound up going toward their commentaries called the Talmud or Talmud, however you want to say that. The Babylonian Talmud, of course, being the most blasphemous of the ones that we, we, we know about. A lot of things justified in that that are, that are just no good. As far as the Torah is concerned, from modern Jews, as I've understood it, when they say the Torah, as I understand it, they're not talking Old Testament. They're talking books of Moses, in my understanding of, their, of, of what they say. So there's a huge difference between what we call the Old Testament and what they call the Torah. Huge difference. Um, about 34 books difference. What's that? Where did they come from? Where did Jews come from or where did... What do you mean where they come from? The five, the Pentateuch is the... The five books you're talking about, the Pentateuch. Yeah. So that's what the Jews, that's the only thing the Jews had? No. Okay. No. So they got stuff from the Talmud. No. So what... No. The Talmud was their, was their, um, was their own commentary on it. Right, right. That, that was... That was what Christ attacked, if you will, when he said you have exchanged your traditions tradition. for the scriptures. That's what he was attacking. Okay. So, so we have more in the Old Testament than just the five books. So where did they come from? Where they were written. I'm not sure where you mean where they come from. They were written. You just recognize the books that we recognize as the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you asking if the Jews recognize other books besides the five books? If you, are you asking that question? Yeah, sure they did. They 
They have 22 or something. Well, we say 39 books. There were some books that were all one, bo one book at one time, like 1st and 2nd Samuel, was divided into two books at one point. At one point was one book, for example. There's that going on. Same way with the Book of Kings. There's, there's, that, there's those things going on. But they were written just like what we know. Moses was a writer. Yeah. I don't want to cut that one off. But yeah. There was a question about um, the recognition of the of the writings here. Mm -hmm. Is what we. It's a. It's kind of the model that we use. It's not that we've decided on what books are in the Bible, but we've recognized. Is that? Is that the way we, we have to look at this? Yeah, and we'll talk about that more, John, but that's, that's a really important point because if you ever go up against a Roman Catholic on this point, the, here's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear that very point. Because the question is always a question of authority. We say as Protestants, the final authority is the Scriptures. They say as a good Roman Catholic, the final authority is the Church. It's the Church and the Councils, right? And the reasoning is that it was the church that gave us the Bible. That's, that's how they reason it. Did you get the reasoning there? We wouldn't have the Bible except the church declared what the Bible is. See that? And what we say is, no, you did not create the canon. You discovered it. Discovered it. Yep. It already existed, whether you saw it or not. I think that's what Marilyn was asking about the Old Testament. Did the Jews recognize all of the Old Testament books that we recognize? Okay. Are there more? Okay. Okay. Uh, here in Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul writes, it says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn, but the dumb not take care of the ox. Uh, he, he, he refers it there that, the, that uh, this illustration is given for the illustration of the laborers worthy of his hire. Uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, personally, uh, he quotes it here. I don't know if he means the same where he quotes it there in Timothy or not. That he's referring back to uh, the Old Testament, or is he referring back to Luke, or you, what you're saying? I don't know. Really. But, well, he's cer right there. He's certainly quoting only only uh, Moses there. Right. Here, here in Timothy, he's actually quoting. He's actually quoting Christ. Oh, he, okay. You see, he, he's actually quoting two sources in one verse and putting on, them on, a, on, on an equivalent plane. Old Testament, New Testament, both inscripturated. I, I never looked at it that way before. That's why I Yeah, I, I know. It's, it's, yeah. I, I mean, you, you, you can easily miss it. You're just reading along Timothy and you're just going, and, you know, yes. Yeah, got to be, you have labor's worthy of his way. It's got to be somewhere in the Old Testament. Actually, not. Actually, Christ said it then in Luke. I, I didn't look at well, yeah, Matthew 10, 10, and, and Luke 10, 7. You, you, you'll, get, you'll find that. Uh, this goes along with, I guess, what Marilyn said, but Jesus said to them, uh, to the Jews, you have the law and the prophets. So they had that, and they thought that Jesus was, you know, he opened up to the book of, of Isaiah. Right. And read it and said, today. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when he read from Isaiah, we, we mentioned, of course, this morning, they recognized our, uh, Isaiah as authoritative. They didn't have a problem with our Isaiah. They were reading it anyway in the synagogue. They were already reading it. The problem they had with was Christ claiming to be the fulfillment of Isaiah. They didn't have a problem with Isaiah. They were good with Isaiah. As they were with all the prophets they had stoned and killed before. It's hard. I'll tell you what, if... if we just need to be thankful that Christ saved us. I'll tell you what. Because if I'd have been living that time, I think I know what side I would have been on. I would have been the right one. Unless God in his mercy reached out. No way. God, God saves us. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's just it. I, I, if it was up to my little choice, no chance. No chance whatsoever. That's, that, that could never be far away from us. In Nazareth, when they were offended by that? They say where? They're in the very place where he grew up. That's what they said. We know this guy. He grew up here. Who does he think he is? We were talking about the Nazarene. Yep. 
It wasn't Nazareth, yeah. It was in Nazareth. Yeah. Yeah, all right, well, good. Um, thank you for your kind attention once again. Let's close with a word of prayer. We're grateful, Lord God. You've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit to open our eyes. Oh, Lord God, may we, may we be humble before you. May we chase out and destroy all that offends and all that gets in the way of hearing you through your word. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.